one on the left looks like it could be very painful, so don't run up and hug whoever's wearing that. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. So it's George the Antique Nomad. I am doing a show in Venice, Florida, and I'd like to take you along. So there's a little bit of Venice's downtown. It was a 1920s boom town that more than doubles in size in the winter, primarily because of tourists from New England. This and look, there's an antique show and we're headed to it. So this is the Venice Community Center and this is where the show is held every January and February. It's a large space, it holds uh, I think around a hundred dealers and it has an area where a local restaurant, Cafe Venice, comes in and does a very nice job with uh, lunches. They basically bring in a short version of their full menu at the restaurant. They have about uh, four blocks from here. So let's go on in and check out what's here today. One of the unusual things about the Venice show when you first walk into the grand entrance that the first dealer you see is actually a dealer in fine furniture and fine art and interiors because it just matches the building so well. I'm going to start with this sideboard here. It has the pearl veneer the proportions are very nice. Look at the fountain in the escutcheon on the drawer pull. That is a really nice detail and that shows that this was a more expensive piece originally new. New era on this, if we pull out the drawer, we're going to see that there is dovetailing and it appears to be very uniform, which means that it was probably done by a machine rather than hand carved. So this piece is going to likely be the second half of the 19th century. Now on top of it, we have several paintings by an American artist named Alphonse Shelton, who worked in the mid 20th century, known in the main area. He actually worked at the Fine Arts Department at the Butera School of Art in Boston. He also spent several summers in Winslow Homer's studio studying and he became a seascape artist. Shelton lived from 1905 to 1972 as shown there on that plaque. You will see plaques on paintings like this on occasion. Sometimes that means it's original, sometimes it means it's painted by someone recreating the artist, so you really have to look closely at paintings. Some of the other pieces in this space have equal provenance. These dealers are very good at giving information about what they have. Here's a lovely little piece. This is an occasional table painted with birds. You know, this one is a little later, they believe 1930s, but the style really becomes popular in the late Victorian period and continues on. Here's another interesting fine art piece. This one is an Andre Guisson. Again, a beach theme. We see a lot of beach theme here in Florida. Uh, but this was someone who went to the Pratt Institute in New York and then sent years in Paris schools and is really a synthesis of Monet and Renoir and also has some evidence of uh, Sumé from uh, Asia. So it's uh, definitely an interesting blend of later 20th century influences. So we're before opening and I'm just going to give you a quick scan to show you the general size of the show. A lot of booths are not open yet. We'll hope to come back and hit some of these before we have to open ourselves. But it's a nice large space. There are also some additional auxiliary rooms with uh, vendor booths as well. I wanted to show these pieces because this is Cornish ware. It's quite likable. It was made in England primarily in the 1920s and 30s, I believe, and it's generally marked really well. It's kitchenware made in England. You see this shield crest, but it is very popular because of the blue stripes. It just has such a great look to it. These canisters are priced at about 110 a piece. I haven't seen a lot of Cornish ware in years. It, a lot of it has gone in collections, but if you're in England or if you're fortunate and come across a collection in the States, it's a great looking kitchen accessory. This dealer also has a lot of really nice brass 
balance scales. These seem to be from England. These are little postal scales here. What's nice is they have all of the weights. You'll notice that they've actually wired these small weights together so that they don't fall out or get lost. And there's also some kilogram scales in the back there. This Krups, which is still a name in scales today, but this is an old one from about 1900. A lot of people who collect scales specifically because they're interesting to look at and there is such variety. Here's a pond boat or pond yacht in this case. Look at the detail in all of the construction of this. This is London made, it says, but they've got the deck rails and stanchions and irons and everything well detailed. It's got a nice rudder. You pull back and you can see all of the stitching in all of the sails. This is going to date to about 1900 and you had to be a child of privilege to have one of these. These were expensive new and definitely expensive now. This one's priced at 495 which is a fair price for what it is. This dealer has a wonderful set of hand-painted porcelain here. Been noticing porcelain lately. I'm finding that younger people are having an interest in this, which is good because it's time for a new generation to pick up some of these beautiful pieces. These are French again. Uh, Limoges, one of the Limoges companies. Here we have a caster set. We should talk about caster sets for a moment. Caster sets were to hold all of your various sauces oil vinegar everything you needed back in the Victorian era they often have between four and ten bottles and they would always have a generally silver plated design bale which is the holder and then the bottles would go in it's hard to find them with all of the bottles and tops matching and no damage so this set is exceptional in that regard I think these silver pieces here which are Various companies ranging from Gorham to Toll to European makers are lots of fun because they have so many different claws. Claws to hold olives, claws to hold sugars. This one has a claw and a spoon behind it. Part of the thing that's really interesting about collecting silver is that there's so many different designs and they can be elegant, interesting, and even weird sometimes. But I just thought that was a really neat looking display. While we're talking about caster sets, the other kind of caster is a pickle caster. These were to hold pickles and pickled items, again from the Victorian table. You'll see it has the tongs here, and then it's got its original glass liner. Now these need to fit the lid and the bottom without a lot of gaps, otherwise they've been replaced. A lot of them were broken and replaced, so if you look at these, make sure that it's a good tight fit. This one has some really nice design elements to it, something akin to Lily of the Valley. Again, a very high style Victorian piece. These sell in clear for around $100 now. I think this one's marked at $110. They've come down a lot in value, uh, but they are very collectible, and because the prices have gone down, people are interested in them again. Look at the fun face on this guy. This is part of a case full of various carved pieces that are Chinese. And these are dynastic era. It takes some study to be able to tell older from newer on this. You will see uh, pieces like the green jade in the middle there. Some of these pieces are quartz, like this one that's just coming into the right of the view. That is a little snuff bottle from about the 17th or 18th century. Some of these are Ming Dynasty. Some of them are Qing Dynasty. When you are looking at stone pieces of this type, this is one area where it does pay to know an expert. I'm fortunate that I have a friend who worked for the Seattle Asian Art Museum and knows a lot about these things. This dealer clearly is knowledgeable about them. It can be very difficult to date Chinese pieces because there were reproductions in later periods of earlier periods. So you'll see something and it may have a mark that would indicate that it is Ming, but it actually was made in a later dynasty in the Ming style. Reproductions are not a new thing. 
Now the old reproductions are still worth money, but it does pay to go to an appraiser if you're not sure about a piece like this. Well, here's a sale you don't see very often. This is a half price sale. You will sometimes see that at antique shows, but you usually won't see nice quality merchandise on the half price table like this. There's some really exceptional pieces here. This is Willett's Belik. Look at the dragon handle on that. Willett's and Lennox both tried to use the Belik name to make it seemed that their wares were as fine as, in, as Irish Belique, but they got sued and had to quit doing that after a while. But that's a 1910s piece. The candlestick is pear point. The piece here, the glass one with the lizard, I find personally rather appealing. Little Victorian piece. We have a portrait with the bone paneling. This should be a little French piece. And it is originally priced at $2.95, so at half price it's uh, about $1.50. A couple of Mary Gregory's here. The one that seems like the best deal to me is this one is Sign Mosier. And that is a cranberry enameled piece and half of $79. Seems pretty hard to believe. Then they have their regular price items. I wanted to show this one because I just think this is really cool. Pillow covers are definitely an area of collectability. This one has actually had a fringe put around it, or actually I should say rope, but this shows Indiana State University at Bloomington, Indiana, and various uh, sites in Bloomington, and I just thought it was really neat. I know I've got some viewers up in that area, so I thought you might enjoy this. This dates to right about 19. Taylor has some wonderful Victorian art class, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to show you some pieces that you might not see too often. Webb was an English maker, and this is enameling over satin glass with the controlled layering so you get the herringbone effect. These pieces in the middle are Stevens and Williams. I love those candy colors. Here's some more pickle casters. You're gonna see some great colors. And the colored are definitely more desirable than the clear. Here's some wonderful pieces of original Tiffany glass from about 1900 to 1910. There were other companies that did the gold besides Tiffany, and one of them is Durand, a company you don't hear of as much, but this is a very nice little Durand piece here. Behind it is a Q Bloss vase, also with the feather pole. These were all various studio art glass makers around 1910. Stu Ben, which of course went on for many years, represented here. These are the things that Carnival Glass shortly thereafter attempted to copy to show this piece here, this tankard. It is really unusual to see this sort of hand detailing and painting and all of the figures appear to be hand painted as well. This case has a lot of fun little things in it that I thought would be neat to show. A couple of wooden needle cases. One says needle case right on it, and the other one has a view of Southport, Maine. And then this is all tartanware. These were souvenir pieces done in Scotland and very popular in the 19 teens and 20s particularly. Look at the cute chenille Santas with the disc faces. Those are neat and some Halloween clickers. And then we're gonna get up into a bunch of sewing implements. So the thimble in the box is gold. And you don't see a lot of gold thimbles. Those were generally just presentation pieces. Gold was not cheap even back in the day. So it was a special thing that you were given and usually wouldn't use too much. Don't see them very often. All the pin cushions are strawberries. There's a bunch of little whisks. The Provincetown piece is a sewing measure. The little acorns up here actually have thimbles and sewing implements inside them. A lot of sewing implements were made to look like other things. And then here we have a sewing chatelaine. So this has the different pieces that hang from the big piece of jewelry and they're going to hold thimbles and needles and other accoutrement that you would need for your task. More interesting sewing implements. This ship made out of abalone shells 
is actually designed to hold a thimble in that little gap there. Another tartanware piece, and then look at this cool thing, this shoe that opens up and has scissors and a thimble inside of it. Novelty pieces that looked like one thing and were actually designed to hold sewing implements were a big deal, and this could have been used as a pincushion, but it never was, so it's immaculate. Never seen a piece quite like this before. They have it priced at 235 and well, I imagine it's that rare. I wanted to show you this too. It's Danish, it's enamel, and it's a porcelain sign, and there's so much interest in advertising signs, but we don't have a big call for advertising signs that are foreign. Uh, the Americans seem to mainly like American. I wanted to show you some more dolls because this one is a jumeau from France and she's black and that is a rare combination. Jumeau is one of the better doll makers and you can see why. Look at the detail. There's visible teeth that are separated. There's glass eyes all of the hand detailing in the painting, the earrings are there. But the fact that it's a black doll makes her very scarce because there wasn't a lot of money in black communities anywhere in the world at that time to buy such things. So she's very valuable now. They have her priced at $1,800, but I'll tell you, I've never seen another one and I don't think many exist and Jumo dolls can be hundreds of dollars, even just the regular ones you see. Now these little cuties, on the other hand, are the Dion quintuplets in composition and these are going to date to the late 1930s. Before Octomom, the Dion quintuplets were a huge deal because they were born I believe in 1934 and it was the first time that five babies had been born simultaneously and all lived. And all of these have their pins with their names on them. They were born in Canada. Very, very vast amounts of merchandising around the Dion quintuplets. They actually had a difficult life. The family was very poor and they were francophones and the government more or less took charge of the quintuplets and turned them into a tourist attraction. I mean they basically had to grow up in in front of the entire world and it took its toll on them. It wasn't the greatest thing but it was such a phenomenon at the time that people were just overwhelmed by the idea. Um, Lots of interesting collectibles for the Dion Quince. One other thing I'll show you. This piece here, this is Dedham. Look at the cute bunny rabbits hopping around the edge. There are 1980s reproductions, but when you can compare them to this, you'll see that the crackling and crazing is very definite and deep in the old pieces. The new stuff is made to look like that. Dedham is, was made in Massachusetts. It's very popular not just with people from New England, but really collectors of blue and white earthenware all over the place. This is a dealer we haven't run into in Florida this year, and they have some interesting toys. The toy soldier here, I believe, is by the Chain, C-H-E-I-N company. Little airplane is an early tin wind-up. And this sand toy is really great with the elevator that raises the sand and dumps it in the thing. This looks like it was practically never played with. Um, and then we've got the wind-up harness racer here. That one's priced at about uh, 95 it looks like. Now this one's been mounted in Lucite, but when you see a clock with a stem underneath, that means it was a car clock. It was meant to be put in the dashboard of a car when they first started doing clocks for cars around the 1920s. They would mount it in the dashboard and then the stem to wind it would sit below. So that's why it wouldn't obviously sit right on a table and you think how could they use it? Well, because it was in your dashboard. Here's a really neat piece, this wooden steamboat called Providence. Very hard piece to find. And it's even got the original 46 or 48 star paper flag. Unusual to find because it's got all the pieces and most of the paper is still on it. This one's priced at $5.95. They are spendy because they are hard to find. They also have some really beautiful Art Deco lamps. You have the boudoir lamps with the bird on the left. The woman on the right. And then in the middle is a New Art. New Art was one of the Art Deco companies really known for this type of work, and the nude lady is a very desirable design. I wanted to show this piece too. It's only priced at 85, which I think is a great price because you never see these anymore. This is a souvenir lamp from Florida from the 1920s era, and it is made of coconuts and 
found sea items. You've got palm fronds here with the spikes sticking out of them as the supports. These are just really funky, cool things. I've never seen them outside of Florida. I don't know them to have been made anywhere else. This one's priced at 85. I have to say, I've had these before and sold them for considerably more. I may come back and talk to them about this one. And then we're gonna go down the row and show you some different dolls because this dealer has not been at any shows that I've done. And again, they have a lot of these really great French fashion dolls. They have uh, the one in the middle here again is another Jumeau. And they also have little Lulu. And little Lulu even has her original purse that says Little Lulu by Marge because that was the name of the artist who came up with Little Lulu. These are a very scarce set of German Skittles. These would have been the types of things you would throw a ball at to knock over. They're made of uh, basically paper mache, so they mainly got mangled by having balls thrown at them. So to find a set of them is very difficult now. And this grouping is priced at somewhere around 125 each, but very hard to find. These dealers have a lot of wonderful items. They're visiting from the Northeast for the season. I believe they come out of New Hampshire. The opaline Easter egg in that brass holder is something that a very well-to-do person would have gotten around Easter time back around 1900. I've never seen exactly that one and you don't see them very often at all. Here's another version. Very collectible items if you can find them. Really good collection of Yadro. They've got the children on the globe. They've got women with applied flowers. The two women with the flower and the parasol, the geisha. There are a lot of difficult to find pieces in this grouping and a lot of discontinued pieces and prices are good anywhere from $45 to a few hundred depending but there's definitely still collectors for these. Yadro is something I look for and if you're out there in resale land and you see a piece if it's in good condition which you have to look carefully then pick it up. Now these pieces are royal Copenhagen from Denmark. Sort of a similar color palette to Yadro, but darker in the blues and a little less detail in the faces typically. Wanted to show you this nursery tea wear. This is a cute little English set, priced around 85. That's what we usually see these little tea sets if they're cute and have the boxes, they go for about that. This one has all sorts of nursery rhymes. There's Red Riding Hood. You've got little Jack Horner sitting in his corner. You've got Puss in Boots, a personal favorite of mine. I've been accused of being Puss in Boots for various reasons having to do with uh, not wanting to get dirty, which I do all the time in my profession anyway. Uh, and then this one here, Little Bo Peep. So that's a really cute set. So I wanted to show you these lamps behind me. I think they're really beautiful and I haven't seen anything quite like them. So let's take a look. There we go. These are applied porcelain at the end of brass mount in the urns. I've never seen this set before. The light comes out and it's similar to the check basket lights, but it's going to underlight all the flowers. So you'll have nice shadowing up the walls really would make a wonderful statement piece in a corner and that's why they're priced at 285 people will pay for things like this that are truly unusual now these are out of texas this is di martino and it has a definitely juliana like aspect to it with the big bib with lots of big stones very colorful it's got all four pieces the earrings the bracelet the bib necklace and the pin as well Lucite necklaces are very popular too. This one on the left looks like it could be very painful, so don't run up and hug whoever's wearing that. And then we have a different case of Chanel jewelry. This is a jewelry dealer, a friend of mine named Janelle. I have the pleasure of uh, helping her with her parents' estate. And she is a good high-end costume jewelry dealer. She just does a few shows a year now. She's semi-retired, but she's got a whole case of beautiful Chanel pieces. She also has this Louis Vuitton luggage. These are real pieces. 
There are various ways that you can tell. One of them is to make sure that the pattern matches along the seams. If you see stuff where the pattern is off, well, that's an indication that there might be a problem. You also look at stitching and various details, and also even at the lettering. There's a lot to know about authenticating this sort of thing and there are houses that can do that for you. There are actually places now that can do a certificate of authenticity for you if you send a piece in and it's not actually that expensive to do. Another interesting painting here is this oil on artist board by William Meyerowitz and this is Boats at Gloucester. It's an American piece. He lived between 1887 and 1981. Even though this is a northeastern scene, anything that is a shore image, a boating related image, seems to do very well here. These deeply carved and inlaid with uh, bone boxes are really desirable. These were made largely in India for the English trade. They're going to primarily date to the mid to late Victorian period, and usually they are sewing boxes. It's Anglo-Indian because it was made for the English market, but it was made in India, so you have this carving, the detailing. Each of these was a pot that would have held some sort of an implement. The caps all screw off. This one has everything, and that's unusual. They're usually missing pieces, and when they have everything, they're worth several hundred dollars. You'll see the painting of the horseman chasing the deer, and you have a tiger, all hand-painted. This is a 18th or 19th century piece, really unusual. Well, now we're open, and unfortunately, that means I've got to go get my booth open. It's so hard to show you everything at these shows because there's just so much, and there's so many really wonderful, beautiful items, so. Look at the kitties. Here's one of these old U.S. Navy pieces that you got when you crossed the equator for the first time. This case has some amazing objects as well. I wanted to point out the enamelware and metal mounted vase with the exotic bird. This piece here in the silver with the mother of pearl handles is an unusual knife holder with the bearded gentleman holding everything aloft for you. The painted porcelain box is European with the cherubs. And I love this electric blue color on these Victorian vases in the silver plate mounts. And if you want your morning juice in style, this Victorian beverage set with the two enameled tumblers and the big pitcher in the middle is a very unusual set to find. And I wanted to show this booth because this is a friend of mine who does like I do. He has a lot of different types of things and they're just really fun and you never know what you might find. But I did want to point this out because this particular piece is so showy and beautiful. It's a um, Royal Art Glass Company slag glass lamp and I love the scenic detail and the metalwork. The thing is, is you know, he's got it priced at $9.95. These things used to go for double that. If you collect this sort of thing or have an interest in it or find this attractive, which I personally do, this is a great time to start collecting because things that used to go for a lot more money are actually available and coming out of collections for the first time in years. This is a piano baby made of bisque. These were made to go on top of your piano and hold down the piano shawl. This one has a mark on the bottom that makes me think it's a 20th century piece. There's a company called Heubach, H-E-U-B-A-C-H in Germany, who's well known for the original. This is another really great lamp, and it is a figural spelter lamp from France, based on French sculpture. This is Le Grasse by Bruchon, and it is a really lovely Art Nouveau piece. This dealer has a great selection of watches. There are pocket watches, wrist watches. They have Longines, Benrus, lots of Bulova. These appear to all be in working order with good original or new bands. They have Hamilton and Tissot. There are gold pieces as well as non-gold, so it's a very nice variety of really beautiful watches. 
a lot of people think people don't wear watches anymore, but that's not really true. They're very popular in Florida, particularly with Latin customers. Now, this is a dealer from New Hampshire who comes down and does the antiquarian book shows. He also deals in a lot of Boy Scout memorabilia, so you'll see some scouting things here. And he gets occasional other ephemeral pieces like this linen here from Pawtucket, Rhode Island that is talking about Samuel Slater, the father of American manufacturers, and then shows the David Harley and Company Merchants Exchange in the corner as one of their sponsors, I'm sure. But he also does a lot of books. There's a huge antiquarian book show in St. Petersburg at the Coliseum where we did the antique show. That'll come up in April every year. And he's got children's books. 1931. It's the first Disney book. The very first. That is very cool. Yeah. Great graphics. Dick and Jane, for those of us who were raised in that era. There's some first editions of famous books. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, I understand, was actually done in 1939, and it was brought about by the Montgomery Ward Company, who were looking for something for an advertising vehicle, and that's where that all came up, and Rudolph has obviously become very famous. On the lower left, we have a first edition of Little Black Sambo. There's obviously, in these days, been a lot of controversy about these books, but it was a very famous story at the time, and it's very collectible. These globe tables are really popular now. This one lights. Sometimes you'll see them where they open up and it's a bar inside. Now, partly because of the beauty of the covers, and it's not even necessarily about what's in them, although hopefully uh, people actually take time to read Lord Bacon's works. There's an entire volume set, but a lot of people just the way, like the way these look on shelves and will buy them for that. whole bunch on Florida here. You have 19 teens and 20s Florida, all the way down to Jimmy Buffett. You hear the expression French provincial tossed around quite a bit, but these actually are from the provinces of France. These are stoneware pieces. You'll see prices on these anywhere from uh, 100 to 250 dollars, depending on the decoration. There's a lot of interest in this sort of thing, thanks to French market-style decorating, and a lot of people have been to the markets in France. French ironstone, and these pieces are good examples of that. Most of these are French rather than English. They have a little more design. The proportions are generally a little more slender. And then when we go back into the back room here, it says more antiques. You'll see a bunch of primitives of mine, the old wash ringer and wheel. And then we have another room full of things here to explore, so let's take a look. First, for fun, we'll start with a few of the new things in my space. I won't show you everything because I've been doing a lot of shows, so some of these things you've seen before, but the Sylvania radio is a neat thing that just came along this last week. and. What's great is it's all there with the headphones in its original box. And to see it complete like that is a pretty cool thing. Worth about $25 to $30 with everything there. And behind it we have this neat piece. It is a Gilby's Gin and Vodka advertising thermometer. It does work. You can see that it's just about 70 indoors, which is about right. This is going to be from the 1950s. This stuff was made in Cincinnati. American advertising seems to do the best in our country, of course. That's about a $65, $75 piece. Just wanted to show that for the first time ever, I have brought Afghans to a show, and yes, I did sell one yesterday. Afghans are the new generation's version of quilts. They're all a little different, they're all handmade, and they are collectible. I had the good fortune also to come up with a bunch of Christmas stuff, and usually I hold on to it, and I wouldn't do Christmas in February, but there's some neat, unusual pieces. This is the Barclay set, which is metal. They were the company that, the American company that made lead soldiers. Well, they did these metal figures that rode in the sleigh. And then we've got a lot of 50s and 60s Christmas items, the little houses from Japan. This set here are Lefton in the original box. These, I believe, are Napco in the original box, the Kissing Santa and Mrs. Claus on the bench. And then a whole bunch of ornaments, and they'd look better if they were out of bags, but they're very fragile, and 
I don't want them to get broken, but there's some cute ones. I like this one particularly with the sort of comet pattern. But it's fun to bring Christmas out. It sells all year long, and these folks, I didn't think it was fair since it's a consignment for them to wait till next year to get paid for this stuff, so we're going to sell it now. There's a Santa ornament original from the 50s. It's probably the best one in the collection. I think I showed the gothic mirror that I got in Mount Dora last week. There it is again. It looks nice with this Hollywood Regency, the Sirocco clock, and this piece I haven't had out at a show this season. This is a nice porcelain flower applied boudoir lamp from about 1960. The tree in the back is Dresden and that's going to be late Victorian with the scenes on it and that is all hand painted. The blue coin spot bowl is Fenton from the 1950s. And then heading up here we see a dry point which is this artist's piece here. This is by Polak and this is a European artist who is very well known and respected for these and is listed and that piece is about $130. One other item of mine that I'm not sure I showed before, this is a cuspidor. I found this in Owensboro, Kentucky. So it would be easily held this way. And you think, well, why would you want to carry something like this around? Well, a cuspidor is a spittoon, and the reason you carried it around is because in the Victorian era, it was not seemly for women to smoke, but it was okay for them to chew tobacco. But it had to be sort of pretty, and something that they could discreetly put under their shawl, lift up the shawl, and into. So, strange use for a pretty piece. Another thing I like to carry are vintage appliances. If they still work, they were so well made, they seem nearly indestructible. Almost all the appliances I have on my counters are vintage, and this is why. The wearing blender on the right is from the 1940s or 50s, and it immediately turned on and worked great, and so did the Sunkiss juicer on the left from the same era. The best part is they're not going to price much higher than a new one. In fact, in some cases, they're less expensive. These particular dealers I haven't seen before, they have some great pieces like these Dresden bottles, the matching pair, this Taza in the cloisonne with the bright blue field is a nice early 20th century piece with the dragon handles. They have a couple of carriage clocks. The one in front here is rather old. They're called carriage clocks because they were made in this way. You'll notice the heavy weight to them. Uh, they also have very thick glass. They have metal on all the corners. The reason for this is they were meant to be taken traveling by carriage with you. And so they had to be able to last a very bumpy ride. My neighbor is a dealer from Belgium and he has some really pretty and interesting pieces of European art deco that will strike you as being a little different than American in certain ways. I want to show the one in the back here. This is a picture frame with the swans on both sides. And if you notice, he told me something I did not know before. When you see the black, in the marbling. That means that these were memorial pieces, so the idea was to put the picture of a departed loved one in the frame. This dealer has a wonderful collection of little boxes and cigarette cases and various boudoir items that I'd like to show. The glare is not our friend, but we'll do our best. There are Russian enamel pieces with great heroes and folk legends. <laughs> and religious icons, as you're going to see here. There's porcelain, European. A lot of these are going to be French. The cigarette cases are enameled. These are unusual. These are French opera glasses, but they actually have transfer screened and then hand-painted embellishment cording and figural scenes on them. This one appears to be Mother of Pearl. This one has nice Japaning. That's when they would use, oftentimes in the old days, coal to blacken in the 
in size design so that they came out more. I wanted to show you some of the dealer from Belgium's other items because he has some really interesting things that we don't see so much in this country. And one thing I wanted to point out is this vase here. It's Val Saint Lambert. This is a Belgian company. They're still in production, although it's more of a studio operation now. But this is cut to clear, 1960s or 70s. You can see the label here. And they do very nice glasswork. It is right up there with the other European makers like Mosier and some of those other famous uh, companies. They did also uh, press glass in the Depression era of an elegant style. This has a nice mark in the bottom that you can see, Val Saint Lambert Belgique. And so there's are definitely items to look for and it's a name that a lot of people are not as familiar with that is valuable and collectible. And then there's this really great cocktail set. I just think that shape is so wonderful. He has another piece here I think is rather interesting too. It's so simple and so elegant. It's just an umbrella stand from a hotel lobby made of aluminum 1930s vintage. And then these Art Deco tables I think have a wonderful shape. There's a very nice piece of Murano glass. And then over here you'll see a number of glass pieces and you have uh, pieces made in Belgium, France, Italy, and you'll notice the colors and shades and varieties and styles are just a little different than what we're used to, which makes them interesting and appealing in a new way, even though they're old. So have these Art Deco elephant bookends, and these are marked Valeris. And Valeris is an important pottery company because they were friends of Picasso, and the Picasso ceramics from the early 50s that are so valuable now were done by Picasso in their studio. I wanted to show you the tale of three pieces of silver, because these tell some pretty good tales. The piece on the left here, with the deep scalloping, is Gorham Rose Pattern. And this is an American maker and it's 300 grams of silver so of course it has value for silver but it also has value because Gorham and particularly the rose pattern are collectible names. The piece on the right, this one is what they call 800 silver. When you see decimal points other than 925 which is sterling, they're either higher than sterling like 950 or 999 which are referred to as fine silver and if they're below 925, then they're what they refer to as coin silver or continental silver because it's widely done in Europe. This one is marked 800, which means it's 80% silver. This is Hanau from Germany, done in the 19th century. It has a very graphic Teutonic looking scene of warriors fighting on battle on horseback. It's a really impressive big piece and priced at 1500 A ton of handwork went into that. The third piece is not sterling, it is silver plate. It is English and it's silver on copper, but this is a fine piece. This is 1840s approximately. You can tell because it was common in that time to do these as giftware with the crystal bowl. Common if you had lots of money, that is. And then you'd have a silversmith make these very elaborate leaf figures, cherub figures. This one, they're children playing with a goat. You can see the goat's horns. And then there's a crest inscribed into the front. A lot of these so thank you for joining me with the Venice Antique Show in Florida. It was a lot of fun. It's over now and it is over for the season. We actually won't be back in Venice until uh, next winter, but I will be coming to you on Periscope, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, with all sorts of other adventures from the world of antiquing and vintage. So thank you for joining us here in Florida. We look forward to showing you things from all over the country throughout the rest of the year. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!